Welcome to Numerical Methods. So we are in a section on the Monte Carlo method. And what I'd like to do today is to discuss with you Monte Carlo integration. So I will give now a, a very short uh, introduction. Yeah? So how we move from the Monte Carlo method that we had already introduced to Monte Carlo integration. But then before I discuss the Monte Carlo integral, and we will also derive the convergence rate for the Monte Carlo integral, I will give a very quick overview of our classical uh, integration rules. Yeah? Um, yeah, if you like to have a more detailed introduction, I can point you to, to a video because that is important to understand uh, yeah, the advantages that the Monte Carlo integral has in, say, higher higher dimensions. Let's maybe start with a small recapitulation of the Monte Carlo method. So in my introduction, yeah, I considered a random number sequence. So that random number sequence could be interpreted as a drawing a drawing of, say, some given random variable x. And then it was important to understand how such a drawing is modeled. So such a drawing is modeled by considering a sequence of iid random variables. So this is here my x tilde, which is the sequence or the vector of iid random variables x1 to xn, yeah, iid and all having then the same distribution as my original random variable x. And then the drawing is just one event evaluated here on this sequence of iid random variables. So that was the first little observation. So this is just one event. Yeah. So sometimes later you could also say it's a sample path. Yeah. If you consider say may maybe the indices of the xi's here as a time. Next step is that for this sequence of iid random variables, we had convergence. So we had convergence of our Monte Carlo approximation. So this here is now our Monte Carlo approximation. Take the average over these IID random variables, which is again a random variable. And this converges in probability to the expectation, yeah, all have the same expectation, so to the expectation of the original X. So we can view this as an approximation method for the expectation. And then we had um, for this an error estimate. So the thing was that we used Chebyshev inequality. Well, we used Chebyshev inequality here with this z being our Monte Carlo approximation. Okay, and then we got that the deviation of our Monte Carlo approximation, this random variable, average over the iid random variables xi. So the difference of this guy from the expectation. So this is less than sigma divided by square root of delta divided by square root of n. Yeah? So you have convergence in the order of one divided by square root of n. Yeah? So it's a constant times one divided by square root of n with a certain probability. And this was the second maybe little drawback. Yeah? You prescribe a certain probability level. Yeah? So you would like to have this convergence with 99% probability, and this results holds only in probability. Yeah, okay, so this uh, first part here, the modeling of the drawing, 
So this was related to modeling the drawing by building the product space. Okay, this was your product space. Then this second part here, the convergence results. Okay, this was the strong law of large numbers so that we have convergence. And here, the last one was our Monte Carlo convergence rate derived from Chebyshev inequality. So now I would like to use this year to build an integration rule. And the following lemma allows us now to extend this results because what we have is if you have a given function f, so there is some function f, say from r to r, if then xi are iid random variables, then f of xi is also a sequence of iid random variables. Okay, so how can I use this? So what we will do is the xi, I just, for example, uniform on 0, 1. And then we have that the Monte Carlo approximation of the expectation of, say, for example, f of x1. So this here is my z1. So if I would like to calculate the expectation, then I can use the Monte Carlo approximation for this. Yeah? So I take the sequence zi and just average over this sequence. So I have here my Monte Carlo approximation of the zi's. And this will converge to expectation of z. Yeah? But now the sets are just f of uh, x. So if x has uniform distribution, then I know that I can calculate this expectation as just the integral from 0 to 1 yeah, over the domain. Well, the density is just 1. yeah. So phi dx is just dx. Yeah? So this is just an integral. So I have that this expression here is a numerical, if I use a fixed n, a numerical approximation of the integral. Okay, now comes the funny magic thing. Uh, recall that I mentioned two aspects. The thing that a drawing is modeled over the product space and the thing that generating a vector of an IID uh, sequence, so an IID vector valued sequence with IID components is just uh, simply take a one-dimensional sequence and populate the entries. These two aspects are responsible for the fact that the Monte Carlo method has a convergence rate which is independent of the dimension, yeah, so that it breaks the curse of dimension. Okay, but when you look back to our convergence result, actually, I still had here on the slide real valued random variable. So I was not even considering the case of higher dimensions. Yeah, I just pointed you to this result. Yeah, it was maybe a little bit a teaser. And also here in the function, it's from R to R. There is nothing with a higher dimension. But the funny magic thing is now, this also holds if you place here a to the power of d. So if this is a function from rd to r, then actually this integral here will be on the domain 0, 1 to the power of d. Okay. Your sequence of rid random variables will be a sequence of random vectors being uniform on this hypercube. But F maps to R, right? You see? And this is where my 
z is. So this zi is still a real value at random variable. And my Monte Carlo convergence result is expressed in terms of the random variables at which we are looking here. Yeah? So it is on the image space. And you see the overhead to generate the set is just populate the entries of the X. So it's just linear. So having the IID sequence XI on the product space is just, yeah, instead of taking D entries yeah, from the one dimensional, I have one entry from the D dimensional. So the, the overhead scales uh, linear, and you see that this is just how we construct the function value and the error estimate somehow on the image space, the dimension doesn't even enter. This is the magic thing. No? So this is my uh, Monte Carlo integral. So I will give a definition for this here a bit later. So I will give a definition here a bit later, but before we look now into the Monte Carlo integral, let's have a very quick review of some classical integration rules, because there you see that the dimension enters and how the dimension affects the convergence rate. So first quick excursus is the Simpsons rule. The Simpsons rule yeah, approximates here the integral from A to B with three points, left point from the interval, right point from the interval, four times the, the center point. Uh, and then you can derive that when you have here certain coefficients, one, four, one, and then divide by six, you have a certain approximation error. Uh, actually, if you think of Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo would just take the sum of function evaluations. You see that we take one function evaluation at the left end point, one function evaluation at the right end point, and four function evaluation at the center point. So it has a weight of four. So these are six times the values. And then I just average divided by six. Yeah? So this is like taking sample points and average. Um, for this, you can derive that you have an approximation error, which is, yeah, okay, some, some constant, and then the length of the interval to the power of five times the fourth derivative. This stuff is derived in a very classical way. You approximate the function by a polynome using Taylor's formula. Yeah. Then the difference of the approximation and the function is the remainder. And then you just integrate. So from this that you use uh, actually three points, you would expect here a third derivative because if you just use uh, one point, you have the correct value and the error is the first derivative. If you use two point, you have the correct value and the correct slope. Yeah, And the error is the second derivative and so on. But the special choice of these weights here in the Simpsons rule actually gives us an additional order. Yeah, so it's the first derivative. But don't care about this. So if you have now an interval that you decompose here into smaller subintervals, for example, in this case, 10, you could apply the Simpsons rule for yeah, every three points here. Okay, so three, three points. And then you take the sum over these Simpsons rules, oh, this one. So actually with 10 points, I have five double intervals. And if you combine these, if you take the sum, actually whenever you are here in a point that is in between two such integrals, you have two function evaluations. Yeah, It's the 
right endpoint for the first approximation and the left endpoint the, of the yeah, second approximation that are added. Yeah, so you will get a two here. So if you do this for the interval, you have a certain scheme, how you weight the function evaluation. And this is actually now the general case. So if you take M plus one evaluation points, so I start counting in zero and I end here in M, yeah, then uh, the approximation of the integral, say the integral from X zero to Xm, yeah. This can be approximated by the Simpsons rule using the following scheme. You evaluate your function here on some equidistant evaluation points. And depending on if they are the left endpoint or the right endpoint, they get, get the weight one. If they are the odd points, the blue ones, they get the weight four. If they are the even points inside the interval, they get the weight two. And my approximation error is of the order h to the power of four. Yeah? So, so here you have a power of five. Yeah. So, but if you sum all these integrals, one of these things is summed up to the length of the total interval, and we have an h of the power of four, which is left here. Yeah, so you have, like you would expect from the Taylor approximation, an approximation error h to the power of four. Yeah, actually, Taylor, with these points, we would expect h to the power of three, but we get, due to the special choice of these weights, a slightly better uh, approximation now. The H is just the size here of my interval. So this here is the H, yeah? so the partitioning. So actually the H is like uh, one divided by M. Yeah? Uh, one divided by M multiplied with the length of the interval um, so the M plus one is the number of the evaluation points. So M intervals of the size H. So here is a code that implements now uh, the integration. So this here is my function F, the integrand. So this is the F from R to R. And then we have say a lower bound and an upper bound of the integral. I will discuss this code a bit later with you when we compare a little bit the integrations, but already here you see it's quite involved. Yeah, you have this um, scheme, yeah, taking the odd points and the even points. So what I'm doing here, actually I start here the loop with I equals one. So I start actually here. Yeah. So we will combine two, four, two, four, two, four. The last one is an odd point. Yeah. So it has a two, four. So I will start at two times I plus zero. And then I take two plus i plus one. So this is two and three. So two and three are the first ones. And then four and five are the second ones. So I'm collecting first these guys with the corresponding weights. The weights are two and four. Yeah, and then I collect the missing points. The missing ones are the zero, the one, and the last one. So I'm collecting here these three missing points, yeah, and then I have calculated the integral. Looks a little bit complicated. 
if you work with Java streams, it is a little bit shorter, the code, yeah, because the loops uh, are now removed and they are just streams. But uh, still, it looks quite quite involved with these uh, with this scheme. You can do the Simpsons rule in higher dimension. So if you do the rule in higher dimension, actually you use iterated integrals. Yeah, I will comment on this, and then you get an approximation error, order h to the power of four. So if I if I now move to say dimensions actually i need the cartesian product so the thing is that i need m plus one sample points in every dimension so i need n sample points but the error is still h in the sense that is one divided by m yeah so if n is roughly m to the power of d this means that the m yeah, the m is n to the power of 1 divided by d. Yeah. So if I would like to express now my error in terms of the evaluation points, it is 1 divided by number of evaluation points to the power of 4 to the power of 1 divided by d. Yeah. Because the error stays the same, but for the higher dimension, I need more sample points. So you see that the convergence rate is degrading. So this is, for example, a 1 divided by square root of n for d equals 8. Yeah? And if you are higher, you, we are getting even, even slower. Yeah? So this is the result of um, applying iterated integrals. Let's have a short look at iterated integrals. So if you consider a one-dimension integration rule yeah, that uses, say, m evaluation points, so this here is my one-dimensional rule, i, which uses m points on the interval 0, 1. So this approximates, for example, here the integrand h. Okay, there is a typo here, right? So this should be an h. Okay. Then you can approximate an integral of a d dimensional function. So consider now f from rd to r no? by considering the iterated integral. You know? So the integral of f dx is actually, okay, just integrate from f the xn component, integrate the xn minus 1 component, and the x1 component, yeah? So keep all the other entries fixed. We are writing this here maybe in maybe with a little bit awkward notation. Yeah? So we fixed the first components of the functions. And then if you look at, say, the function g, where the first components are fixed, and just the last component is available, then this is a function on zero one. one, this is a one-dimensional function. So we start with G superscript D being the function F, fixing the last component, fixing all the previous component, yeah, from X1 to N minus one. Um, we integrate over the last component and there we use now our one-dimensional integration rule. So I use now my one-dimensional integration rule here on this function where only the last component is uh, free. Yeah? So I'm sampling, I'm discretizing the last component. If you iterate this, actually you cre are creating the Cartesian product. Yeah? So this here is my discretization 
of the interval. This is the discretization for x1 or x1 with a different x2 and so on. Discretization again for x1 with a different x2 and so on. And the discretization for x2 is also just my discretization, which I have from my one-dimensional integration rule. So what I'm doing in this iterated integral is we integrate alongside one variable. Yeah. So here it's if you if you write this iteration like this and you first integrate numerically the first component, then we arrive at these values for different values of the second component. And then we integrate again a one-dimensional integral and arrive at the value of the two-dimensional integral. So you see, if you have a one-dimensional integration rule and you lift it to higher dimensions using iterated integrals, you arrive at a Cartesian product of the function evaluation points. So this will be important later if we look at the interpretation. Uh, yeah, Y is actually the Monte Carlo method breaking the curse of dimension. Yeah, So why has the Monte Carlo method not this, this issue? That we need yeah, more sample points that grow even exponentially in the, in the dimension. Okay, so if you have these iterated integrals, you need m to the power of d evaluation points if m is the number of evaluation points that you have for your one-dimensional integration rule. Two small uh, exercises. Actually, this is part of an assignment. Try this, for example, with a Riemann sum. So a Riemann sum using center points is actually given by evaluating the function which you like to integrate on the center points of the equipartitioning of your interval. Yeah? So this is 0, 1. Yeah? So now I have a small partition here, say, for intervals, and I'm now evaluating the function at the center points. Okay. And then you can calculate the integral. Yeah? So for example, the integral is this area plus this area plus maybe this area and that area. Yeah? So if your function has these values. Okay. So it is function value times the size of the interval. Since I'm integrating from zero to n, the size of the interval is just the one divided by n. Okay, have a look at this expression. This looks exactly like my Monte Carlo approximation. Yeah? It is one divided by number of sample points, this average of evaluating the function at the sample points. The, so the only difference is that here in the Riemann sum, the position of the sample points is chosen according to a certain rule, yeah? well, not, run, not random. So if you would now use iterated integrals to calculate here this d-dimensional integral, you have just the same, yeah, one divided by n, number of function evaluation points, take the sum over all function evaluations, but now the function evaluations are given by points that come from the Cartesian product of these points. So you see you have here the one-dimensional discretization to the power of d. So these are now my um, xi's. You can also do this for the Simpsons rule. This looks a little bit more complicated because you have these weights, yeah, the two, four, two, four, yeah, and then the endpoint at, at the one. So you get some weights here in front, 
AI. Actually, these AIs have this form. Yeah, it's one plus m plus one to the power of d divided by m to the power of d, because uh, we have actually one more evaluation point than we have intervals, yeah? and then you have some in higher dimensions some combination of these weights, so a four to the power of k multiplied with a two to the power of j. Mm -hmm. um, so you have some weights, but apart from this, it's just one divided by the number of evaluation points times evaluating the function at certain evaluation points. The evaluation points are now the Cartesian product of the points that are used for the Simpsons rule. So these are the endpoints of the intervals, including the first one and the last one. Yeah, so one additional point. So we start in zero and we end in m, yeah, and this is then to the power of so the number of the evaluation points grows exponentially, but my error estimate is still the one from the one-dimensional rule, yeah? because you could have an error in one dimension and all the other integrals are just constant. Yeah? So you will get exactly this error from the one dimension. So the error is still the distance. So it's still the one divided by m, but I use m to the power of d or m plus one to the power of d. Yeah. So if you relate now the error to the number of evaluation points, it is of the order, yeah, number of evaluation points to the power of one divided by d. Yeah. To the power of, if you have a, a certain integration rule that is a little bit better, four, three, whatever, but if the d becomes larger, your convergence becomes slow. Yeah, so a little exercise, maybe you implement this you can you can actually create elegant implementation for the for this constructing the Cartesian product and then you can check yeah that if you go to ten dimensions yeah that this stuff is getting really really slow yeah and suddenly Monte Carlo integral takes over. So that was a sh short overview over classical integration.